It is time for our doctrine and devotion. Uh, we are going back into our book study. And when I say we're going back into that book study, in our book study, it's because you probably would have noticed that last week we took a detour, a very good detour. It's always a good detour uh, to talk about the doctrine of God. We talked about divine simplicity, what it means when we say that God is without parts. But we're back together. So we're heading back to our book study. For those of you that don't know, we've been going through the mystery of Christ, his, king, his covenant, and his kingdom, which was written by Dr. Sam Renihan. Um, does anybody remember what chapter one was all about? Chapter one was about these two things, two fields of theology, or doing theology, called? Systematic theology. Okay, and biblical, and biblical theology, that's right. Systematic theology and biblical theology in covenant theology. Uh, and we talked about the idea of you know, certain types of, of theological studies focus on the trees, that is the up close and personal details. That's more of a systematic theology approach. Uh, some studies like biblical theology focus on the forest. We look at the big picture, the grand scheme of things. And when we do covenant theology, we're inevitably looking at both the trees and the forest. Both the trees and the forest. We see the overarching redemptive plan of God, but we also see that in the context of having a, a, a New Testament ecclesiology, sacramentology, and all of these uh, important detailed doctrinal issues. So as we jump into chapter two, which is about this very important hermeneutical feature called typology, I want us to open our Bibles to the passage that I actually preached from last Sunday morning. And that is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, we'll just read the first five verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we begin this class on typology, help us to follow along with the thought process of the New Testament authors and their audiences when they continuously pointed to Old Testament people, places, things, and events, and help their hearers understand how it pointed to Christ. Whatever it is that we study this afternoon, Lord, may it point us to Jesus, and may this study of typology cause us to be better readers of the Bible, and to interpret and enjoy the Bible in light of its testimony to Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, like I said, Last, uh, I mean, two weeks ago, we studied biblical theology and systematic theology in covenant theology. And that last part that we got introduced to, this idea of history and mystery, was very important because the idea here is that God is progressively unveiling His glorious mystery, which is ultimately the person and work of Christ and His establishing of the kingdom and His drawing both Jew and Gentile into one he unfolds this mystery in history. They're not just abstract ideas. Someone asked the question several weeks ago, when, I think when we looked at the preface, why did God extend the Old Testament period for so long before Jesus came? Why did He let so much of this stuff happen, both good and bad? Why was there so much history? That was essentially the question. Well, we weren't given the words yet by chapter one. Why was there so much history before the unfolding of the mystery? That was essentially the question in one of our Q&As. And the answer, I hope, um, we will find is in, at least partially, in the concept of typology. 
Uh, what, what, what we're saying when we say that God was teaching us so many things throughout history is that God saw fit to cause all of those many, many, many centuries to become like a living tapestry through which he threads through Jesus Christ. And so now we can look back at Old Testament history and we can go, oh, this was pointing to Christ. This was pointing to Christ. That was pointing to Christ. And when we do that, I want you to know when we're doing this and we're seeing typology, I'll define the terms in a bit. We're not just making this up as we go. Neither are we saying that the New Testament authors looked at Old Testament people, places, and events, and they, they said, oh yeah, that, that's, that could totally talk about Jesus. Well, let's, let's, just, let's just put that into the, into the New Testament. That totally kind of, that kind of sounds like Jesus. You know, the ark, the, that, yeah, yeah, that sounds like Jesus. So let's just put it in. Hey, now it's a type. No. As we talk about typology, let us understand that things in the Old Testament pointing to Jesus, that was always their purpose. It was always God's intention to use these people, places, and events to point to Jesus. So we'll answer the question, what is typology? Uh, we'll look at the relation between a type, that's the, the original thing, um, or the previous thing, and its antitype. The antitype, it may seem like a weird word to you. It's not like antichrist, it's not like, you know, a bad thing necessarily. It's the, it's the other thing, which the old thing was pointing to. What's the relationship? Um, we'll look at four things that um, we can say about the relationship between type and antitype. And then we'll look at the application of these typological principles on the ground, where the rubber hits the road. So, uh, before I do that, I actually, sorry, wanted to grab it, the books. Um, Obviously, the mystery of Christ is what we're studying. If you really want to study typology, and I will quote from this book today, this is material that's not found in our book study, and because you already have the book and you can read the book, I wanted to introduce some material that's not there as well to help you. 40 questions about typology and allegory by Mitchell Chase. Uh, I've spoken to the author of this book. He's a great guy, and he did an amazing job with this book. We're very afraid of the word allegory, and I think for good reason, because of the whole allegorical interpretation that basically just spiritualizes all of the Bible and misses the whole point of what passages in the Bible mean. We're right to recoil from that. But there are such things as biblical allegory. Like in Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 to 31, it says that the two wives of the two, the two children of Abraham, uh, Ishmael and then Isaac, and how, is, how one is of the slave woman and one is of the free woman. Galatians says Paul, the, uh, Paul says in Galatians literally that that was an allegory. He uses the word allegory. So if you want to study typology, which we're studying today, and biblical allegory, I highly recommend this book. Uh, you can actually get it from Quran. You can actually order it from Quran. Okay, so I'll quote from that uh, a little bit, but of course, mostly we're gonna look at what our, our brother, Dr. Sam Renihan says about typology. So, in the introduction he writes, typology is one of the most important pieces of biblical interpretation in general. I hope you will see in our study today, I don't think it's gonna be much of a long study, I'm gonna give you uh, discussion groups, uh, I hope you will see that's not an overstatement. Typology is one of the most important pieces of biblical interpretation in general. It's not an overstatement. I hope you see that today. As well as the mystery of Christ and covenant theology in particular. Gentry and Wellam, who wrote the book Kingdom Through Covenant, again, they are a what you call a more of a progressive covenantalism perspective. We agree with a lot of what they write. We agree with, we disagree with some of the things they write, but uh, we, we love the overlap. They write, it is difficult to think of biblical types and patterns that are not associated with the biblical covenants. In other words, to reflect upon typological structures and their development is to simultaneously unpack the biblical covenants across redemptive history. Now, what, what is he saying? He's saying when we think about types and shadows of things to come. They're very much covenantally involved. Like when we say that the old covenant, which had animal sacrifices, the blood of that covenant did not truly purify one's conscience. 
So you see there's a contrast being made between the blood offered under the Old Covenant and the blood offered, which is the blood of Christ, in the New Covenant. So when we think of types and shadows, we need to think covenantally because that's what the Bible does. Now, just a footnote to avoid confusion, we will use the word typical in relation to a type and antitypical in relation to an antitype, okay? Had to have that footnote because you might think that t the way we're using typical today is, you know, this is the typical person that, you know, no, we're talking about the type and the antitype. Uh, and then typological in relation to types and antitypes considered together. So, what is typology? Well, in G.K. Beale's handbook on the New Testament use of the Old Testament, he writes, typology is the study of analogical correspondence among revealed truths about persons, events, institutions, and other things within the historical framework of God's special revelation, which, from a retrospective view, when you look back at it, are of a prophetic nature and are escalated, escalated in their meaning. According to this definition, the essential characteristics of a type are, number one, analogical correspondence. What does that mean? We'll see. Two, historicity. Three, and <laughs> you can't get any more literal than this, a pointing forwardness. A type in the Old Testament has a pointing forwardness. Fourth, there's actually five things, sorry. Fourth, escalation. Not only is it pointing forward, it's pointing to something greater. And then fifth, retrospective. In retrospect, the New Testament authors look back and say this was always pointing us to that. Now for those of you who are a bit visual, um, I don't know how helpful this is, but hopefully it is. This is a bit of a diagram on how biblical typology works. When the New Testament authors say that, let's say the ark points us to Christ, or Jesus is our Passover lamb, that's what the New Testament authors say. They are not just pulling things out of thin air. They're actually following the typological nature of the Old Testament. And in eternity, let's start with letter A, we go A, B, C. In eternity, God always had an intended purpose to point to salvation, glorify Jesus, exalt Jesus, present the gospel. It's always these wonderful redemptive things. That's always been God's intention. So God had always intended to, to bring that reality into time and space like Jesus himself. He was always planned to come. He was always going to come. That's been the plan since eternity past. But what God decided to do for the majority of biblical history, majority of, of the Old Testament before Jesus came, is he presented the shadow of reality. He would, in time and space, in the Old Testament, bring about shadows, bring about types. Uh, a type, again, is a thing that points to something other than itself. A thing that points to something greater. So God gave the Passover lamb. God gave the Old Testament priesthood. God gave the sacrificial system. God gave the rock that we just read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which Moses struck and water flowed out. And little did they know, little did they know, it was always meant to point to Jesus who was the wellspring of life, living water. In Old Testament history, the shadow of that reality which God always wanted to teach us and show to us and bring to us was brought to earth. And the Old Testament shadow of reality was meant to prefigure, prefigure, before the reality came, prefigure the substance of reality. Another way to put it is that the types of the Old Testament are concerned with shadows of things to come. Is that familiar? That's New Testament language. The types of the Old Testament are concerned with shadows of things to come. The New Testament presentation of Christ and His mystery is the substance. From shadow to substance, which is a wonderful title of another book by Dr. Sam Renihan called From Shadow to Substance, The Federal Theology of the 17th Century Particular Baptist. It's a great book that he wrote his dissertation on. So that's what typology is about. These shadows in the Old Testament were pointing to the reality, the substance of salvation. So Mitch Chase 
helpfully writes in his book, the Greek term tupos, that's where we get the word type, occurs 15 times in the New Testament. What does it mean? Okay, let's get to the word itself. It refers to an impression or an image, an example, or a pattern. In at least four instances, biblical authors use tupos or typos to connect to an earlier part of Scripture. You want to see what the New Testament authors teach us about the word type or the idea of a type? Well, let's learn from them. First, Paul calls Adam a type of Christ. He writes, we studied this when we studied the preface, remember? Yet death faint, sorry, reigned, feigned, death reigned from Adam to Moses. It feigned later on, <laughs> even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. There's one instance of typology by the New Testament authors. Second, Paul labels certain events in Israel's history types for his readers. He writes, now these things took place as examples, that's the passage we read earlier, types, that's tupos, for us. The shadows, the types are examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Um, that's what we read in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 10. Third, here's another way. The writer of Hebrews refers to the pattern or type that Moses used for the construction of the tabernacle. And this structure was a shadow of heavenly realities. So it, it's not always just literally pointing to the human being Jesus, um, although the temple is because Jesus says that his body is the temple. But when you think about um, the tabernacle, it's pointing to a higher and loftier and greater eternal tabernacle, the very house of God. He writes that the Old Testament priests themselves serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. Okay, so these old rea realities were pointing to greater things. So it's, they're like signs. And here's the thing about signs. The signs are not identical to the things which the sign points to. This is very instructive as to our understanding of the relationship between Old and New Testaments. They're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. One was concerned with shadows, and one, the New, gives us the substance, from shadow to substance. So when we think about the Old Covenant shadows, like the priesthood, like its order of worship, and like all of those things, they are able to commune with God and be saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not because of the shadows, but because of the substance which those shadows point to. Okay, there is a distinction. If the shadows in and of themselves was sufficient, then why need the new covenant? We could have just stayed in the old covenant. But no, it was pointing to something greater. Here's a layman's explanation. The idea of typology is this is pointing to that. That's it. In the Bible, we will see things where this is pointing to that. What do I mean? It's pointing to Christ for the most part. You think about the bronze, you think about the ark. And indeed, the ark was a really important redemptive event and actual historical thing in the Old Testament. And then later, Peter says, uh, he likens this to being baptized into Christ Jesus, being saved through the ark amidst God's waters of judgment. He likens it to baptism to Jesus Christ or being engrafted into the body of Christ, being saved. When we think about um, Abraham offering up Isaac, well, this is a clear place where God shows he is, that is from the Simpsons, he is providing a substitute. And he's the kind of God that provides a substitute. Who is that pointing us to? Well, I don't know. It's Jesus. It's Christ. Christ is the only uh, son of God whom he did not spare, for he is the provision. He is the substitute. We think about the bronze serpent. And the people grumble, the people sin, they got bit by serpents, then God told Moses, raise up this bronze serpent, and everybody who looks upon that bronze serpent, serpent shall be healed. 
Jesus himself in John chapter 3 likens the bronze serpent to himself. And when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw people unto himself. Whoever looks upon the Son, just like they looked upon the serpent, shall be spiritually healed. Of course, the Passover lamb. How can you escape? Well, it's, it's very clear that the New Testament literally says Jesus is our Passover lamb. But the thing is, although the types could not save you in and of themselves, God saw fit to use them to effectively reveal the substance. In other words, even if you were not in the New Testament era yet, by looking at the types of shadows, if you were truly a child of God, if, if you belong to the Lord, you'd be able to look at the types and shadows and apprehend spiritually the greater realities which God was pointing to. You could be saved by forward-looking faith. Not faith in the literal lamb of, pa of the Passover, but in the final sacrifice that you knew God will ultimately offer because He is the one that said in Genesis 3.15 that He will send the serpent crusher to bring us back to the garden. Faith in these promises. Uh, how about the scapegoat? And again, the scapegoat is another example of how Jesus is our scapegoat. Jesus is not only the one whose blood is shed. I mean, there's two goats on the Day of Atonement, right? He's not, Jesus is not only the one whose blood is shed and God is pleased by His perfect sacrifice on our behalf. He is also the one who expiates our sin. He is the one who brings our sin to the north country, if you will. He is the one that, he was the one that brings it into the outer darkness and he, he, he suffered on our behalf to expiate us of our sin. So that's a bit of a layman's explanation. Is that helpful? This is pointing to that. That's typology. Now, there's a fourth thing that uh, Mitch Chase mentions uh, in the Bible. Fourth in Luke's record of Stephen's speech, the martyr, Stephen, speaks of his sa this same pattern that Moses had received concerning the tabernacle. Stephen says, Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he spoke to Moses, directing him to make it according to the pattern, the tupos, that he had seen. So, believe it or not, um, the idea of typology is not just something that theologians made up. It is a hermeneutical principle that the New Testament authors themselves exercised. Now, I want to present a challenge for all, of, for all of us. Do we believe that the Bible is sufficient to equip the man of God for every good work? No or amen? Amen. amen. So when you want to learn hermeneutics, textbooks help. Church history helps. It's all good. You know me. I love utilizing that stuff. I love utilizing all of these things. But do you believe that the Bible itself can teach you hermeneutics? That's the question for you today. Do you believe that the New Testament authors are sufficient? And also with the old, of course, the whole Bible is sufficient to teach you hermeneutics. What's hermeneutics? Principles of biblical interpretation. Brothers and sisters, if you can't draw your principles of biblical interpretation from the Bible itself, then maybe you're undermining the sufficiency of Scripture. So we right now are seeking to follow the mindset and the footsteps of the New Testament authors. They viewed the Old Covenant as primarily concerned with shadows and the New Testament with the substance with the which the shadows pointed to. We need to read the Bible in the same way that Jesus and the apostles read the Bible. And a huge part of that is viewing the Old and New Covenant relationship as typological. So as Beal said earlier, the essential characteristics of a type are these five things. Analogical correspondence. What does that mean? The old thing and the new thing, or the type and the antitype, um, are analogically related. They're, they're not completely unrelated, okay? Like when we talk about the ark, which saved the people from the destruction of the flood, and we talk about baptism and faith in the Lord Jesus as an appeal to a good conscience. Those aren't two completely unrelated things. There's an analogical relationship. Jesus himself is our ark of safety. And in the same way that Moses uh, went through the waters 
He went through the very waters of the flood, but he did so in the ark of safety. We too escape God's judgment through our ark of safety, Jesus Christ. And that is pictured for us through baptism. There's an analogical correspondence. Secondly, there's historicity. These are actual historical places, people, things, events, and sometimes even general concepts, but they take place in time and history, in space. There's a pointing forwardness, okay? So there's always, as you read the Old Testament, you should be excited when you're reading Old Testament history, narrative. It should be exciting because there is a pointing forwardness. And if you're a Christian, you know very well what it's pointing forward to. And it's very, very exciting to start to see how things are pointing forward. You, you didn't uh, see these things before, but now when you reread the Old Testament, you go, oh my, oh my, even back then, these people were already anticipating Jesus. And it's so clear. It's right here. There's a pointing forwardness. Fourth, there's an escal escalation. When we go from type to the anti-type, it doesn't get like, it doesn't get worse. And we're talking about po po pointing to Jesus. Um, Jesus is always greater than his types, okay? It's always an escalation. It's a great climactic escalation in Jesus Christ. When we talk about the heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly temple, when we get the vision of the eschatological temple in the book of Revelation, it is escalated. It is always greater. And then fifthly, retrospection. What is that? That's that concept where in retrospect or in looking back, you begin to see these um, connections. When we do this, we are practicing a very important hermeneutical principle, okay, interpretive principle, which is that since God has, He didn't do the Bible this way. He didn't give us the Gospel of John first, and then after many, of, many years, He gave us the book of Genesis. That's not what He did. He progressively revealed the Bible, the Word to us. And what is the Bible? It is a self-revelation of God Himself. He started with Genesis, and He slowly but surely gave us person after person, writer after writer, prophecy after prophecy, book after book, until we get to the New Testament, and until we finally get to the book of Revelation. And because of that, let me put it in a, in a technical way that Dr. Richard Barcelos likes to put it, and he put it this way when he did our hermeneutics conference. Um, and, and, and that is, well, actually, I don't want to put it his way. I'll put it in a simpler way. That is, revelation that comes later on often makes explicit what was implicit in revelation that came before. Revelation that comes later on, like in the New Testament, often makes explicit what was only implicit in the revelation that came before. Like, you could have known many of these things, but let's be honest, it's not until the New Testament authors help us out because they have the bigger picture. Christ is the interpretive key. He has now arrived. He has now come. We can look back in retrospect and see, ah, that's what it was all meant to point to. What we're doing right there is we are practicing a principle called New Testament priority. Tom Hicks writes this, one important aspect of biblical hermeneutics, the theory of biblical interpretation, is the principle of New Testament priority. At the beginning of the Middle Ages, Augustine of Hippo, we like him, right? We like him, he's pretty cool, expressed New Testament priority with the phrase, the new is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. What's being presented to us in Old and New Covenants ultimately is of the same substance. It's Jesus. Jesus is being presented to us. But Jesus in the Old Testament is like a room. And you're in the room and you can see stuff, but it's dimly lit. But you can see stuff and you're there. And you're nevertheless in the room. You're right there. In the New Covenant though, the lights turn on and you see all the furniture and you see everything around you, not only are you there, like you start to begin to understand what is really going on around you. Augustine meant that the Old Testament contains shadowy types and figures that are only clearly revealed in the New Testament. In other words, the New Testament explains the Old Testament. And this, guys, this is not arbitrary. It's not like the Old Testament, we didn't know what it meant. 
And it was only until the New Testament authors, until we finally knew what it meant. No, 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 no. It's not two different meanings. Never. That's bad hermeneutics. The New Testament helps us understand what the Old Testament meant all along. What it meant all, this is not new meaning. Some people scratch their heads and go, well, you know what? Some of the New Testament authors, they quote some Old Testament passages. And in my opinion, based on my hermeneutical principles, they misquoted the Old Testament. Ooh. Do we believe in the inerrancy, infallibility, and sufficiency of the Bible, including the New Testament, and that every single word of the New Testament and Old Testament is the inspired word of God? If we do, can't say that. You can't say that an inspired writing misquoted the Old Testament. No. What we need to do when that happens is we need to reevaluate our own approach to interpreting the Old Testament. And we need to go, Obviously, the New Testament authors were taught by Jesus, and they had the Spirit of God, which illumined their eyes and allowed them to write inspired scriptures. They know something that I don't. They're seeing something that I'm missing. The Protestant reformers and Puritans also looked to the New Testament to govern their interpretation of the old. An early confessional, particular Baptist, Nehemiah Cox, agreed with the reform perspective, interpretive principle when he wrote, the best interpreter of the Old Testament is the Holy Spirit speaking to us in the New. Do you like a good commentary? Who here sometimes enjoys Matthew Henry's commentary? I enjoy it very much. I want you to remember, Matthew Henry is not inspired. The New Testament is inspired. I love Matthew Henry. I will read him. I will read him all the time. And all of these other guys. I love modern commentators as well. I love um, uh, many of the great commentators that are coming out today. Whether it be old or new, I enjoy these things and I think they're important because we need them. We don't want to interpret the Bible in a vacuum chamber without consulting the people of God. Uh, that's, that's proud. But understand this. The New Testament is an inspired commentary on the Old Testament. You really want to understand the Old Testament. Yes, read the commentaries, use your Bible software, do all that good stuff, do all of it. But don't forget that the New Testament is an inspired commentary of the Old Testament. It's the Holy Spirit's commentary that helps us understand what was going on in the Old Testament all along. This was that. Now, some common objections that people have to this kind of New Testament priority and typological principles? First of all, they say, the apostles interpreted by inspiration, we can't. Now, here's our response. Amen. I mean, who in the world is gonna say that we're insp inspired? Nobody's gonna say that, right? Amen, the apostles interpreted by inspiration, they wrote by inspiration, we can't do that. That's why I'm saying, trust the New Testament. And our response, therefore, is not, therefore, don't be like the apostles. Our response is, ah, oh, men, therefore, we learn hermeneutics from them, but must be studious and careful. You see here, don't be overreactionary. reactionary Don't say, the apostles did it because, you know, they were special. They go, okay, good, then learn from them. Learn from their specialness. Learn from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's given us a divine commentary. Wouldn't it be good? that the way we interpret the Old Testament is aligned with the principles that Jesus and the apostles themselves presented on how to interpret the Old Testament? Somebody says typological hermeneutics can be abused. You know, you, you get these like weird, crazy, spiritualized, allegorized views of the Old Testament that completely miss the point. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't like that either. I don't think that's good. I don't think that's good for anybody. Just like all hermeneutical principles, it can be abused. It can be abused. You know, even, I, I think we all need to, um, to, to understand that the best way to interpret the Bible is the historical grammatical method of interpreting the Bible. And the historical grammatical method that's actually looking at the context, looking at the things, uh, taking the Bible at its word, uh, literally at face value, unless it is the one that tells you otherwise, we need to do this, and we need to do this theologically, redemptively, understanding progressive history. So I actually like to say historical, grammatical, redemptive. We need to view the Bible uh, and interpret the Bible historically, grammatically, and redemptively. We, we, it's not, these are not two warring worlds. We need to bring them together. And just like any hermeneutical principle, 
Like, for example, grammatical interpretation. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, you know, um, the word in this passage comes from the Greek word, uh, you know, like, uh, this is a popular one, power, okay, dunamis. It comes from the Greek word dynamite. And what Paul was saying is that we need to be, the gospel is explosive like dynamite or blah, blah, blah. It's just like, dynamite is a new word that was invented very recently. So you got to be careful. Could you do that in the right way? You could do it in the right way. Could you do it in a weird and wrong and completely ahistorical way? You could. You could start saying that Paul was writing because of C4. And, you know, the nuclear, why would, no, don't say that, don't do that, it can be abused. So, our response to this is, don't abuse, be careful, just don't abuse. Allow scripture to guide you in interpreting scripture. Here's one more. We shouldn't interpret the Bible theologically. We should only interpret it as we would any piece of literature. And our response is, bro, come on. Come on. Don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that we should interpret the Bible as any piece of literature, or not bro, sis, sis, come on. Don't, don't say that. What are you saying? This is the holy book. This is the scriptures. This is the inspired word. We don't read it just like any book. We can learn, like yes, can you apply some, um, the way that you read the newspaper? If you're a, if you're a, if you're a good um, reader, you know how to read the newspaper really well and get the facts out. Can that help you in interpreting the Bible? Of course it can, because it is literature. It is words, but it is, theological literature. And by theological, I mean that it is divine, it is spiritual, it is the self-revelation of God. The, these 66 books are united in such a way that no human being alone could have concocted in their minds. This is a special book. We need to read it as such. That's probably my favorite response, bro, come on. So what is the relation between a type and its anti-type? The thing and the thing which it points to. Uh, here are a few guidelines. Types reveal something greater and other than themselves. So like when you, when you ask very detailed things, like is there a relationship between Old Covenant circumcision and New Covenant baptism? Of course there's a relation. But typologically we know that the old thing reveals something greater and other. We cannot say that the New Covenant ordinance or sacrament of baptism is literally the same thing as the old covenant and i don't think i don't think anybody wants to say that and therefore and we talked about this um, during chapter one i think uh, therefore if you want to understand how to administer old covenant circumcision consult the old covenant it'll tell you how if you want to understand how to administer new covenant baptism and the lord's supper and blah 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 consult the new covenant um, but you can learn from the old, but remember, the old type is pointing to something greater and other than themselves. So th that's an important feature of typology. Otherness. The previous thing is not simply pointing, okay, the word other is so important, because you might get confused with greater. You might think that the main difference between the old covenant and the new is that it's the same thing, it just escalated. It just improved. No, 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 no. The difference between the old stuff and the new stuff is that the new stuff is other. It's new, it is distinct. It is greater than the old. Secondly, types function on two levels. Obviously, the level of the type and the level of the anti-type, okay? Um, we don't want to eisegete. What's eisegete? It's put our own ideas into the text of Scripture. So in other words, we, we read the text from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we were told that when Moses did all of that stuff, they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So we don't, we're not about to go, you know, like, and when Moses struck the thing, he gave an altar call. And he said, if anyone would trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, this rock, no, 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 they didn't have that, okay? Types function on two levels. There's the level of the type, it served a purpose. It has a historical context. It meant something to the original people. But remember, it was pointing to something greater and other than itself, which is that level of the antitype, which is ultimately the greatest provision of God, the source of living water, who is Jesus Christ himself. 
Thirdly, types terminate in their antitypes, okay? No more sacrificial system, because the type is done. The antitype has arrived, okay? The antitype has arrived. You and I are not trying to build a sanctuary with a holy of holies, because the antitype has arrived, okay? So all of these things need to be understood in the context that the types were always meant to terminate, or they're done when the, the antitype arrives. Uh, fourthly, types are positive and negative. In other words, you can get a good thing from the Old Testament, and it teaches you about Jesus, right? Like manna in the wilderness. Is that a bad thing? That's a good thing. Jesus said he is the bread of life. He's the, one, he's the bread from heaven. That's a good thing. You can also get bad stuff. So you can get Adam, right? Is Adam a good example? Adam's a bad example. But he can still be a type of Christ. Because types can work positively. Type can, types can also work negatively. So you can take a good example from Scripture and go, and that points us to Christ. And you can take a bad example from the Old Testament. This is what the New Testament author does, what Paul does, and says, basically, it points us to Christ in the sense that Christ is infinitely greater than that one. So it can work positively, it can work negatively. Are we following along with these, these principles of the relationship between type and anti-type? Very, very good. So now, how do we apply these typological principles? Well, the truth is, we're not going to go into this super deeply today because that's what the rest of the book is about. It's, it's about how we're going to apply this, okay? We're here for the tools, but a few words uh, are important. Uh, Sam writes, the unity of Reformed Covenant theology was founded on the law-gospel distinction, two different paths of righteousness, right? Righteousness by our own obedience, that door has been shut since Adam disobeyed. Righteousness by the obedience of another, the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the gospel. And that distinction was expressed in the covenant of works and covenant of grace. Condemnation in Adam and salvation in Christ, this was a source of unity. Okay, that's always been true. When we make this distinction between Old and New Covenant, we're not, we're not those people that are saying, oh, and actually, if you ask the average evangelical, they might actually think this way. How were you saved during the days of the Old Covenant? Many people will say, oh, you have to obey the law. But now that Jesus has come, it's by grace through faith. Okay, that's many, many people think that way. We don't believe that. We believe in the overarching unity of condemnation in Adam and salvation in Christ. Salvation through the gospel was available from the fall onward. Um, we're going to get into one of our favorite guys, John Owen. He acknowledged this unity by saying, all who contend about these things, except the Sicinians, all right? He's like, everybody agrees, except those guys, the Sicinians. Sicinians are bad news. Do grant that the covenant of grace considered absolutely, that is the promise of grace in and by Jesus Christ, was the only way and means of salvation into the church from the first entrance of sin. The covenant of grace, uh, by the shed blood of Jesus, by the finished work of Christ, faith in Him, that's always been the only way. It's always been the only way since day one. Uh, and Owen and uh, other people had different views, therefore, on the relationship of the Old Covenant to the overarching um, story of salvation and how one is to be saved. John Owen and many of the particular Baptists, that's the Calvinistic or Reformed, whatever you want to call them, Baptists, whom we, whom we um, associate with. Uh, interesting, John Owen remained uh, a pedo-Baptist, baptizing infants, yet we actually follow in his footsteps in, in terms of much, uh, we thought that what he said regarding covenant theology was actually very helpful. And, you know, you have all of the uh, anecdotes. If you lived long enough, he would have become a Baptist. But anyway, um, John Owen and many of the particular Baptists viewed the Old Covenant this way. The Old Covenant pointed to salvation by the New Covenant through its types and shadows, but did not provide salvation in and of itself. Now, many people would agree with that in a general sense. But what Owen here is saying is to be distinguished between uh, many of the Westminster divines, that's the, the men um, who played a role in the Westminster Assembly in crafting the Westminster Confession and whatnot, um, guys like Anthony Burgess would say that, well, the Old Covenant was simply the covenant of grace in immature form, while the New Covenant is the same substance 
in mature form. So it's, it's the same substance. The difference here is not of otherness. John Owen would be otherness. The Old Covenant is pointing to something other, greater. For Anthony Burgess and, and many uh, of the other Reformed folks, they would say it's not otherness, it's just escalation. Immature to mature. What are the repercussions? For Owen's view and for our view, the Old Covenant therefore progressively revealed salvation by the New Covenant, but was substantially distinct from it. All right? The Old Covenant progressively revealed salvation, which is by the New Covenant. But the Old Covenant remains substantially distinct from it. While the other folks' views would be that the Old and New Covenants are therefore simply two administrations of the same covenant of grace. Okay, so you get the difference there? This is why many of our brothers and sisters that land here are willing to take many, 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 many principles, institutions, and ordinances from the Old Covenant and carry it over into the way that we should do things as the New Covenant Church. While guys like John Owen, this was seen in their, in their um, 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 church government, congregationalism, but further on for the particular Baptists in their, in their belief in more of a, a regenerate church membership and so on and so forth, is that no, 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 no. Because it's not just of greater degree, but the Old Covenant is actually a distinct thing in substance of the New Covenant, if we want to know what the church should look like. If we want to know how do we do things as a church, who are the members of a church, etc. We look at the New Covenant because that is our covenant. That is the salvation covenant. That is the covenant which redeems. All that saying, all of those salvation realities of the New Covenant were already available to the Old Covenant believer. How was it available to them when Jesus had not yet come? Types and shadows. How can they know about the Messiah? Types and shadows, promises, prophecies, foretellings. They look at Joshua the high priest. They look at what we've studied in Zechariah about the future branch. And in that vision, Joshua the high priest is a? He's a type. That's right. Now you know how to do it. He's a type. And therefore, they can look at Joshua the high priest and recognize that Joshua the high priest is pointing to something that is substantially other and greater, and that is the branch, the same branch and stump which Jeremiah talks about. We looked at Jeremiah, and, uh, sorry, Isaiah talks about in Isaiah 6 and so forth. And they can have forward-looking faith and have salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Uh, Sam helpfully writes, Owen appealed to the relation of type and anti-type, to describe the relationship between old and new covenants. Owen affirmed that types were not anti-types in lesser form. They had a different nature. Specifically, all the Levitical sacrifices and ordinances were in themselves carnal. Carnal doesn't mean sinful per se, it means earthly and had carnal ends, earthly ends, assigned unto them. So how do we view the Old Covenant? Is it spiritual? Of course it's spiritual. But what is it concerned with? It's concerned with theocratic Israel. And it's concerned with blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. And it exiles people out of the land for their rampant disobedience. And it brings them into a land and flourishes them in a land flowing with milk and honey upon their obedience. That's what Owen means by carnal. It was earthly realities meant to point to heavenly realities. Uh, Owen called Israel a typical church. Okay, N not the church per se but pointing to the people of God in the new, with a great number of religious laws and ordinances in themselves, carnal and weak, but mystically significant of spiritual and heavenly things. Thus, the Old Covenant as a whole was typical, shadowy, and that's why removable. Hebrews 10. The New Covenant is substantial and permanent and contain, as containing the body, which is Christ. The Old Covenant shadow, the New Covenant substance. Have you ever looked at your own shadow? If you look at your shadow, you can learn a lot of things about you. You could see maybe how tall you are. You can even measure it according to 
where the sun is at, and if you're really mathematical, maybe you've got an app for that, you can look at somebody's shadow, and you can find out exactly how tall they are. You could do that. You could find out what their hair is like. You might even find out if they're a man or a woman. Are we allowed to say that anymore? These things can be known through shadows. But you don't stare at the shadow and speak to the shadow and hang out with the shadow. You don't do that. You go to the substance, the actual human being who's standing right there. Uh, that is a bit of a, a sneak and in, peek into the relationship between Old Covenant shadow, New Covenant substance. Here it is. Let me summarize it for you. No, 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 no. Let Hebrews summarize it for you. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form, substance of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make, a perf make perfect those who draw near. I believe Hebrews was written before the temple was destroyed. And therefore, I believe that the sacrificial system was still active at the time that the pastor to the Hebrews was writing and preaching. And therefore, he was calling upon them to say, look at the, the shadows. Stop looking at the shadows. The shadows are not the substance. Enough with the shadows. Go to the substance. It's time for Christ. He has already come. And that was the whole purpose of the old system. It's not sinful. It's not bad but it was just meant to point to something greater, and we have that greater thing in Christ. For Owen, that's William Kiffin, particular Baptist, salvation was made available in the Old Testament through the promises of the covenant of grace which were made known through typology. Look at the priests, look at the system, look at the daily sacrifices, look at the law, look at this and look at that. Look at all of these things and hope in God. Trust in the Messiah whom He promises to send. Trust in His perfect sacrifice that He, is, he provides. Trust in Him. And of course, we get to know more about Jesus through these types and shadows. So lastly, the particular Baptist distinctive was that they, also, that they applied these principles not just to Moses. Okay, I'm going to leave a cliffhanger here and then you're going to go into a discussion group just to think about it. Like Owen, but also to Abraham. So this is where we go, Owen, you're cool, man. You're great. Thank you. We're going to go further than you. We're willing to go further than you. We're not just going to say this about Moses. We're going to say this about Abraham as well. What do you mean? They argued, therefore, that in the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant of grace is revealed and made known by the earthly promises, land, many people, seed, and so on, and blessing for all people through them. Yes, those are all really, literally promises given to an actual nation, an actual people, physically, okay? But the covenant of grace remains distinct from it. The writer to the Hebrews tells us Abraham knew that it was a country greater than Canaan. He knew. He was looking forward to a city whose builder and founder is God. Because the Abrahamic covenant was not in itself the covenant of grace. Even Abraham himself, oh father Abraham, was looking to something greater. It could not be used, therefore, as the pattern for membership in the new covenant, nor could circumcision be the pattern for baptism. The type revealed but was distinct from the anti-type. The types reveal, but are distinct from the anti-type. This is our short study on typology.